Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Sinat Rachman, Executive Director of the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And welcome to Disinformation and the Erosion of Democracy, hosted by The Atlantic and the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Here at IOP, our mission is to foster in our students a passion for public service, meaningful dialogue, and active engagement in our democracy. And to also to instill that democracy is not a gift to be taken for granted, but an ongoing project that requires vigilance and commitment. Part of this mission is to safeguard the principles central to the stre strength of our democracy. And this conference is motivated by the growing evidence that disinformation, turbocharged by social media algorithms, and manipulated by malign actors, is a threat to democracies everywhere. But we're the Institute of Politics and we're in the business of hope. So our goals for this conference are to focus on the scope of the problem and sources, but also its potential solutions. And so for all of you students in the room and those joining the conference virtually, you're the next generation of leaders in public service. And we want you to pay special attention to the, special, to the potential solutions raised over the course of this conference. We hope that for some of you, this conference motivates you to take action on this issue as you advance your professional journeys. Over the next three days, we'll hear from some of the most foremost experts in the world on topics like what happens when we can't tell what's real, disinformation and the subversion of elections, defending free speech in the mobile internet age, and imagining a better social media. That's just a little snapshot of all of the panels we have. Then in a few weeks, we'll be hosting an ideathon for students to put their ideas into action on this issue. In planning this set of discussions, we knew that we needed a strong th thought partner and we could think of none other than The Atlantic, whose writing and thought leadership on disinformation are unparalleled. And we're so grateful for your partnership on this conference um, and your thought leadership on this issue. Thank you. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to the Bentivoglio Family Fund, the Joyce Foundation, and the Crankstart Foundation for supporting this conference and for bringing it, all to, for bringing it to life. It is now my pleasure to introduce Paul, Dr. Paul Olivasatos. Dr. Olivasatos is the 14th president of the University of Chicago and the John D. MacArthur Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Chemistry, the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, and the college. A preeminent scientist and entrepreneur, his pioneering research in the field of nanomaterials has demonstrated key applications of nanocrystals in such areas as biological imaging and renewable energy. His inventions are widely used in biomedicine and QLED TV displays, and his scientific advances, advances have yielded more than 50 patents. Prior to commencing as president in September 2021, Elvis Sato served as executive vice chancellor and provost of the University of California, Berkeley, and held a number of positions at Berkeley prior to that. And an alumnus of the college, Elvis Sato earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1981 and his PhD in chemistry from Berkeley in 1986. And as a president of University of Chicago, he is focused on deepening the university's connections and engagement both locally and internationally, and in finding new ways to connect the university's culture of academic rigor, open discourse, and impactful discovery with the complex challenges that we face as a global society. Please join me in welcoming Doc President Paul Alvisatos to the stage. Thank you so much, Zainat. And um, allow me to start by thanking the Institute of Politics. I'd like to thank you, Zainat, for everything that you're doing. And I'd like to especially acknowledge David Axelrod. David, um, what you have done to help create the environment um, of the Institute of Politics has been so remarkable. It has done so much to help this university. And you have taught me so much while I've been in this role. I'd like to especially welcome our um, uh, partners uh, from the Atlantic today. Uh, it was a real thrill for me actually to get to meet some of you because I am a subscriber and actually I, <laughs> every, <laughs> every night actually when I'm doing my kind of media downloads, there's a whole bunch of Atlantic articles in there and I love reading them. So I, I felt like I was, you know, I'm a groupie right now. So, <laughs> so to, you know, to acknowledge Editor-in-Chief Jeffrey Goldberg as well as uh, Adrian LaFrance um, Ellen Cushing and Emily Gottschalk uh, McCarney, thank you all for being here. It also gives me great pleasure to acknowledge our alumnus um, uh, from the college, uh, Aaron Simpson, 
um, who is a current uh, Institute of Politics Pritzker Fellow and who has played a big role in thinking about um, a seminar series t entitled Disinformation USA, a socio-technical reckoning on where we go from here. Um, it speaks to the power of uh, Chicago education uh, that, that, um, that she has brought that forth. It is no accident, I think, that this event is being held here today uh, as democracy is being challenged and, and the very fabric of how we uh, access information and learn um, is so much in threat. Uh, this also, this university is a very special place. Um, in fact, when uh, William Rainey Harper founded the university, uh, he founded it on certain core principles which are held fast to, to this day, and which make the university the special place that it is. Uh, I'm calling out specifically his insistence on academic freedom and freedom of expression, and calling how he called those out as the foundational principles by which it's possible for a faculty, no matter which topic they are studying, uh, are able to struggle to find um, the questions and to argue uh, in order to arrive at a better understanding of the truth or of what underlies every situation, whether it be a question of politics or a question of physics or chemistry, the academic freedom and freedom of expression are the core values. They are the essential values that enable a university to thrive. And, and so um, I do think it's very special uh, that this event is held here today. Another thing that R William Rainey Harper deeply believed in him, which is greatly motivating to me, is he uh, imagined what I have been calling the engaged university. From the very first day of his presidency, he conceived of the university as tied to the fabric of society. Even as we thought about the deepest and hardest problems uh, that humanity can imagine, at the same time, he cared very much about the university being an engaged partner. So today, we have many partner institutions here, and we are grappling with an issue that our um, global societies all must, uh, must approach uh, and on which we have so much to learn. It is actually also a little bit of a personal topic for me. Some of you may know that in, um, I had um, the difficult experience as a teenager of growing up in a military dictatorship, the junta in Greece, uh, during my teen years. And I vividly recall um, the experience um, of, of being in an information lockdown. We knew as students that we didn't know what was happening. That was something everybody took for granted. We just knew that we didn't know. But we didn't know what we didn't know. <laughs> we had no way of knowing it. Uh, except occasionally I had the privilege just because of the type of family that I was in that every so often somebody would go abroad and when they would come back they would bring magazines with them. <laughs> So occasionally, I still recall as a 13-year-old having a copy of Time magazine, <laughs> which was our source of information. And the stories in there were just so completely contradictory to what was in our own media uh, that it was astonishing. And, um, and that was how uh, I experienced um, the complete information lockdown. Of course, the struggle between freedom of information and control and misinformation is as old as uh, human societies, and it's constantly changing. And so today we're in a world where uh, the internet, social media, and other, uh, other aspects of it uh, remain um, uh, new challenges for us that we have to explore, even as we see that the kind of brute force methods that were used during you know, my adolescence also are used um, with devastating effect. So it's a huge topic for us today, and it's one where I'm really looking forward uh, to, to being informed and to learning as much as I possibly can. It gives me enormous um, uh, pride to be able to introduce the next speaker, uh, Maria Ressa. Um, she is a heroic figure, a journalist in Asia for more than 35 years. She co-founded Rappler, which is the top um, digital-only digital only news site uh, that leads the fight for press freedom in the Philippines. As Rappler's CEO and president, she has endured constant political harassment and arrests by the Duarte government. She has been forced to post bail 10 times to stay free. 
um, and her battle for truth and democracy is the subject of the 2020 Sundance Film Festival documentary, A Thousand Cuts. In October of 2021, she was recognized, she was one of two journalists who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition for her efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. I think you all know that her co-recipient, um, Dmitry Muratov, uh, his, his um, Novaya Gazeta was recently silenced. Among her many awards for her principled stances include the Golden Pen of Freedom Award, the Knight International Journalism Award, the Gwen Eiffel Press Freedom Award, the Shorenstein Journalism Award from Stanford, the Free Media Pioneer Award from the International Press Institute, and the Sergei Magnitsky Award for Investigative Journalism. Maria, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the stage. Thank you, thank you. Nice. It's so wonderful to be here. Uh, I, I asked if I could bring my cell phone, and I was told yes. But you know, when I was walking over, I was like, the air feels different because it really does. I had, in order to get here, I had to get court approvals for seven criminal charges. And I wasn't sure I could get here, but I'm so thrilled to be here and to see so many friends. Um, so I, I'm gonna be quick because you really wanna hear from Adrian. Uh, and you know what, um, but thank you for allowing me and for listening, uh, allowing me to be here. So for us, we're 33 days before our presidential elections. Filipinos are going to the poll and we are choosing 18,000 posts, including the president and vice president. And how do you have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts? That's a reality that we're living with. All right, so here's, here's what I'm gonna try to do. Um, I've put all of this stuff together in a book. Um, and this is part of the reason you'll see these ideas over and over. And the question I really wanna ask you is the question we had to confront. What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? Because these are the times we live in. Um, the prologue for the book, which I pushed in last year, at the end of last year, right after uh, the Nobel awarding was, you know, I, the prologue started with Crimea and the annexation in 2014 because that's when you began to see the splintering of reality that had geopolitical impact. And uh, of course, I've had to revise it once Russia invaded the Ukraine. And the question I, that goes through my head is, if in 2014, i.e. eight years ago, we did something about it, uh, would we be where we are today, right? No, we wouldn't be. So here's what I'm gonna talk about today, like really just three things. What happened? How did it change us? Um, and then the third is, what can we do about it? Because these are critical for me. Uh, it's existential. You know, I call it an, an Avengers Assemble moment. In the Philippines, really, and guess what? Your elections are coming up too. <laughs> so, um, ain't so far away for you. Here. I've said this over and over, that really, this is... When this happened, 140,000 people died instantly in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the same thing has happened in our information ecosystem, but it is silent and it is insidious. Uh, this is what I said in the Nobel, Nobel lecture. An, an atom bomb has exploded in our information ecosystem. And here's the reason why, right? Very simple things. And I peg it to when journalists lost the gatekeeping powers. Atlantic, I wish we still had the gatekeeping powers, but we don't. And we probably lost it around 2014 to 2015. 2014 pivotal. 2015 was when instant articles rolled out. Um, so that meant we brought news into the social media platforms um, voluntarily. <laughs> we did this voluntarily. So what happened? Content creation, and I hate it when journalists are called content creators because we're much more than that. I think the key part of journalism is courage. But content creation was separated from distribution. And then the distribution had completely new rules that no one knew about. 
we experienced it in motion. Uh, and by 2018, MIT writes a paper that says that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than facts. I've, this is my 36 year as a journalist. I've spent that entire time learning how to tell stories that will make you care. But when we're up against lies, we just can't win because facts are really boring. <laughs> you know, hard to capture your amygdala the way lies do. So this is baked into that, right? So, it's, so think about it like this, right? All of our debate starts with content moderation. This is on the tech platforms. That's downstream. Move further upstream to algorithmic amplification. That's the operating system that determines, that's where the micro-targeting, what is algorithm, opinion in code. That's where like one editor's decision is multiplied millions and millions of times. And that's not even where the problem is. You go further upstream to here, which is where our personal data has been pulled together by machine learning for a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. And then all of that is pulled together by artificial intelligence. And that's the mother load, right? That means that surveillance capitalism, Shoshana Zuboff's business model, right? That is what powers this entire thing. And we only debate content moderation. That's like, you know, if it's a polluted river, you're only looking at the test tube of water versus where the pollutant is coming from. I call it a virus of flies. But that's important because today, we live in a behavior modification system. The platforms, the tech platforms that now distribute the news are actually biased against facts and they're biased against journalists, right? Um, E.O. Wilson, uh, he passed away in December, but he, he studies emergent behavior in ants. So think about emergent behavior in humans, right? He said the greatest crisis we face is our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. Now think of emergent human behavior. What travels faster and further? Hate, anger, conspiracy theories, right? And then do you wonder why? We're, our, we have no shared space. I say this over and over. Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these, we have no shared space. And democracy is a dream. Oh, sorry, one last back. Ah, not again, not again, don't. One more time. <laughs> um, um, surveillance capitalism, this, this, our private experiences, pulls together all of these four things. And we look at them as separate problems, but they're identical, right? That is antitrust. There's three antitrust um, bills that are pending at the US Senate. Data privacy. Who owns your data? Do you or does the company that collates them and creates a model of you? Um, user safety. Do we have a better business bureau for our brains? And the fourth, content moderation, which is as long as you're thinking content, you're not looking at everything else. All right, so uh, I'm going to kind of show you how we discovered it. So this is a little granular, and I'm gonna go through this fast because you can plug in your own version of what you've discovered. This is how we discovered it in the Philippines, and it was in September 2016, when a bomb exploded in Davao City, the home city of President Duterte, and what was interesting is that was the headline, but yet a six month old article. So this is disinformation, right? You take a truth, twist it. Six month old, man with a bomb found at a checkpoint. And it was seeded in websites, fake websites. If I click that website today, it's a Chinese website. Um, and it was seeded on Facebook pages. Duterte and Marcos pages. And so this is the story that we did in, in, in uh, 2016, propaganda war weaponizing the internet. It was part of a three-part series. The second part was this. It looks like a lot of data. It's only an Excel sheet, but it's one account, um, Lu Vimin Kansho. And we looked at this account and found it strange that she didn't have many friends, but was members of many, many, many groups. And then we took the photo and did a reverse imaging scan. 
Korean pop star, not this person. Um, and then we took a look at who was following, who was she following, who were her friends. This is 2016, so you could still get that. So this is the Excel sheet that we did. And then each one of us took one vertical column and tried to prove whether it was actually true, where, she, where they went to school, where they lived. Every single thing there is a lie. This is a sock puppet network, right? And so we, my co-founder did this, fake accounts, manufactured reality on social media. The last part, the last part of the trilogy, and again, think this is 2016, was uh, I wrote the, this last part, which is how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. It didn't get better, it got worse. Um, so what did we do? In order to do that, once you realize it's systematic, that it is taking a lie and pounding, that it is using free speech to stifle free speech, right? Because when you are pounded to silence, you kind of shut up, unless you're foolish like me, <laughs> you know? Um, so what we did is we took all the data, and here's the data of something that we gave our social media team. Um, we're, we were alpha partners of Facebook, and we're still partners. Rappler is one of two Filipino fact-checking partners of Facebook until today. I'd say we're frenemies. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think tech is part of the solution. So look, this is what happened in 2016 when we rolled out that three-part series. Um, all the way to the left is the website. So you can see they work together, right? And then in the middle is the Facebook page that shares the website. And then it turns red when it's shared more than 10 times. This is what happened after we posted those, we published those, that internet weaponization of the internet series. So it was 2016, October, and it turned red. And you can see, I'm gonna bring you into the Facebook page of Sally Matai. This has now been taken down. But you can see the method methodology, right? It's a cut and paste account. This one is just the growth part where we were still catching their growth. You gotta look, the data's pretty incredible. So everything I tell you is data driven. And you can also see we kept track of how many times they were posting in which Facebook pages. This is the first time we saw Marcos and Duterte disinformation networks working together. Ah, I'm gonna bring it back to you because the methodology is the same. This is a map from the Election Integrity Partnership of Stop the Steal. And this is the same methodology used to attack me. Um, in Stop the Steal, you can see that the narrative of election fraud was seeded in August 2019 on RT, then picked up uh, uh, by Steve Bannon on YouTube, seeded in closed pages. Then Tucker Carlson picks it up, uh, and then QAnon drops it October 7th, and President Trump, then President Trump comes top down. What happened to me in 2016? A lie told a million times became a fact. My meta-narrative, journalist equals criminal. And then a year later, President Duterte came top down with the same meta-narrative, except he did it in his State of the Nation address. You know? And then a week later, I got my first subpoena. That year, we had 14 investigations. Uh, in less than two years, by 2019, I got 10 arrest warrants. Posted bail 10 times. So, same methodology. See how it is happening to you. What happened to me in July? <sighs> in the middle of the pandemic, I was the first case. My former colleague and I, this is cyber libel, for a story that was published eight years earlier when the period of libel was only, period of prescription is one year, right? Lo and behold, <laughs> it became 12 years. Um, but I was convicted, and so I'm appealing this at the Court of Appeals, but this is the headline of the New York Times. It says, conviction in the Philippines reveals Facebook's, I can't remember the last one, but <laughs> um, harms, I think. These are real world harms, right? So um, this is happening to women and women journalists. Uh, if you remember, one of the things that Mark Zuckerberg says is that, you know, the, the way he, he, he quotes Brandeis all the time, the way you get at bad speech is to have more speech. 
in the old days. Brandeis wrote that in 1927. In the age of social media, when you, are, when you have the age of abundance, uh, we have to look back at Brandeis's words, and you'll see that in, his, um, in what he wrote, he also said that, um, he said that women are burned as witches. He referred to how women, how, how what we are seeing today, I mean, these words are, are what it reminded me. How gender disinformation hit women, journalists, politicians, it brings out the worst of us because it's almost like if you're my age, you remember the old cartoon when you, know, you have a conscience and you have a devil and an angel trying to tell you what to do on each shoulder. But what social media has done, what American tech has done, well, you gotta include TikTok now. Um, but what it's done is it's kicked off the angel, it's given the devil a megaphone, and it's injected directly into your brain. So this is a UNESCO report, The Chilling Global Trends in Online Violence. And what's interesting here is I was the example for the Global South. Carol Cadwallader, the British journalist who broke the Cambridge Analytica story, was the Global North. And you can see this is ICFJ, the International Center for Journalists, said that 75% that of women journalists um, experienced online, 73% experienced online abuse, 25% received threats of physical violence, like death threats. I get a lot of those. 20% um, had been attacked or abused offline in connection. What happens in the virtual world happens in the real world, right? That, that thing where people think they're different, disabuse your mind of that. There is only one world um, because we live in both worlds, right? Um, this is what happened the kinds of attacks that came against me. They, mesh, they looked at almost half a million social media attacks. There was a point in time when I was getting 90, 90 hate messages per hour. And you can see what they meant to do. 60% was meant to tear down credibility. There's a reason why you don't believe news organizations anymore, because that is an information operation. And then the second part, 40%, were meant to tear down my spirit. It didn't work. But it's really painful. Now I'm going to just wrap this up so Adrian could come up, right? So this is after the Nobel, I come back home and then I realize, oh my gosh, I'm getting new attacks again. That's December, like here, at that spike of attacks, right? And so all I did was I just went through and found out, okay, so where are the attacks coming from? This is Twitter. And you can see what we looked at were, were the creation dates of the Twitter accounts. They were all created around the time of elections. Uh, did I mention 33 days before elections? It's, uh, it's like 1986 all over again. The Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is running an, against another widow, Lenny Robredo. She's our vice president. So look at that big spike. Now, that is the pro-Marcos account. This is the, the gray are the pro-Lenny account. So you can see something that would be looking more organic versus something that looks artificial, right? The red is artificial. We gave it to Twitter, and guess what they did? So, well, well, first we did a story before we gave it to Twitter. And then Twitter did this. It says suspends over 300 uh, accounts in the Marcos network. Um, there'll be more, which hopefully we will be seeing, because the gatekeeping, you know, if you're a gatekeeper, you cannot abdicate responsibility, because you subject all of us to the harms. Um, here's the solution, and I'm gonna, tech, journalism, community. Those are the three pillars of Rappler, even from the beginning, right? So you hear me, like I, part of the reason I'm here is because I testified at the Senate Subcommittee on East Asian Affairs, and I asked for legislation. It's not where I started in 2016, because I thought they were like journalists, you know, self-regulation, they're not. Um, so, so technology needs guardrails in place, and we can talk about that more. Uh, but the second thing is journalism needs to survive, right? Oh, the tech part. We built a platform, right? Spent a lot of money at it and took much longer because so much of our money was going to legal fees. Um, but it's rolling out in time for our elections. It's, and then the second part is we got to help independent media survive. And that's part of the reason before the Nobel, I agreed to co-chair the International Fund for Public Interest Media that's asking governments in the democratic world, democratic governments to actually 
put some money to help journalists survive. And then finally, the last is community. Now, I want to show you how they all come into effect because we're in the last 33 days before elections. I call it the hashtag facts first PH and don't strain yourself. I can, I'll tweet the actual thing. But what it is, is there is a tech platform going through the four layers of this pyramid. And we really started, this is kind of what I used the Nobel for. Um, this, uh, we started building this community January. And you know, what it is is you realize that fact checking, news organizations rarely share each other have never really in the Philippines. And so what we did is 16 news organizations committed to fact check the lies. We ask our communities, when you see a lie, send it to us on the same tip line. And then we, we this is working with Midan and the Google News Initiative. We actually said, all right, we're gonna meta tag everything. It's gonna have the data. And then we're gonna be able to course it through the four layers of this pyramid. What are the four layers? So each of the news groups, have links to each other, that's good for search, and they also then share each other. Use your power, right? Um, and then beyond that, it moves to the second layer, I call it the mesh. Again, it's fun to make things up. Do you guys see that movie, uh, Don't Look Up? Do you see that? You remember how the, interplanet the planetary defense system came together like a mesh? That's kind of the way we have to live right now on social media because meaning has been commoditized and each of us has to take our area of influence and clean it up. Then we connect it to each other like a mesh. So these are all our human rights organizations, our business groups, the church, environmental groups, civil societies, and NGO who are taking what the news groups are doing and sharing it with emotion because we don't have emotions, we journalists. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> um, and then after MESH, you go up to research. You, this is, was actually inspired by your election integrity partnership in the US. So this is every week, a research group, one of the seven, will come out and tell Filipinos how we are being manipulated, who is gaining and who is behind the networks of disinformation. And finally, the last layer is the most important one, and they've been quiet for too long legal groups, right? If you don't have facts, you cannot have rule of law. So these legal groups now are working hand in hand with the pyramid. They get the data pipeline and they then file both strategic and tactical litigation. Um, I'll tell you how it goes in 33 days, but it's working because Look at the cases, so I'm gonna end soon, don't worry. Um, these are my legal cases, I have seven. Those are the ones I have to ask for permission to travel. But just on April Fool's, and it wasn't an April Fool's joke, seven new legal complaints were thrown out. That's good. But we also have 16 more new ones, right? So this isn't ending, it's still a whack-a-mole game. Um, but we will win it. The one that I think is important, just look at the last one, this is from the Solicitor General who really started the weaponization of the law. And he called the facts first PH, he called fact checking prior restraint. And in, on April 10th, so right before here, I was looking at our submission to the Supreme Court because we had 10 days to file. We're gonna win this. So that's where I'll pull it all together, right? I think what this world shows us is that um, we have a lot more in common then we have differences, believe it or not. Uh, as a journalist, I grew up um, looking at each country and every culture differently. But what the tech platforms actually showed us is the silver lining. We're all being manipulated the same way. <laughs> you know, we have a lot more in common. So even things like identity politics, right? What happened in the US in 2016 when both sides of Black Lives Matter was pounded open. Be aware. Think slow, not fast. Thank you. <laughs>